This message, titled The Revelations of the End, is brought to you by Pastor Banke Oyebade, one of the ministers under Pastor Ben Akabweze of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, the King's Court Parish, 1387 Olosa Street, Victoria Island, Lagos, Nigeria. For inquiries, call 0802-8263-408. May you be blessed as you listen in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome King of Glory, we welcome your presence. We exalt your majesty, thou King that reigns in glory and power and majesty and strength. There is none to be compared unto you. You alone are God. You alone are King. You alone are the Lord God Almighty, the strength of our life. Lord, I welcome your presence right now. Holy Spirit, I ask that you take absolute control of this message. Lord Jesus, I declare your Lordship in this place. I ask, O oh God, that you speak through me and let every hearer be blessed in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray the blood of Jesus over my body, soul, and spirit. I pray the blood of Jesus over the hearers and I bind every powers of darkness that want to hold the people bound from giving their lives to Christ. I come against you in the name of Jesus. I command you to lose them now in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Brethren, this morning I'd like to give you the message that the Lord has sent me to give the body of Christ everywhere I have the opportunity to share or everywhere I'll be permitted. Some few years back, the Lord showed me a revelation. And in that revelation, I was told that time is going. I heard it over and over repeatedly. Time, banker, time is going. Banker, time is going. And then, all of a sudden, I saw um, an escort. He held me by the hand and began to, and we began to run together. There was panicking and there was tension. And all of a sudden, we came across a valley. And in the valley, there were, there were multitude of souls. Most of them were dying, and some of them were probably dead. Most of them were crying. It was very awful. The sight was very, very awful. Many of them were like dead bones. And the cries were so intense and frightening for me. We ran through this valley of multitudes of souls, millions of them. And then the escorts took me to a white house. And in the white house, he signaled unto me. It was a very, very big mansion. He signaled unto me to go in. And I went in. As I went in, sorry, before then, um, I, I, had, I had behind me time is going. This is the people you are to save. And I was wondering, the people I'm to save? At first, I had thought, okay, maybe God wanted me to become a president because that had always been my passion. I had always wanted to become, I had always wanted to become Nigeria's first lady um, president or to become a governor. So I was thinking, oh, maybe my dream is coming to pass. But by the time I got to um, the White House, as I entered in, there was a very, very big hall. And at the end of the big hall, very, very extensive big hall, was this man sitting. And he beckoned on me to come forward. I went in, and then he beckoned on me to sit on the chair. I sat on the chair, and I was like, Wondering what's happening. What do you have to say? How, am I, how are you supposed to help me? Because that is what the escort told me. He said, I should go and see this man who is going to help me to save the souls. And as I got there, the man looked at my eyes and he was wondering, 
And I was wondering, too, why is he looking at me that way? And he said, Banquet, don't you know that time is going? And I was, in my heart, I was like, time is going. So what am I supposed to do? Anyway, that was how that dream ended. Or that revelation, that was how it ended. And after it ended, the Holy Spirit began to make me understand that these are the people that the Lord wants me to go and save with the help of the Lord Jesus Christ. The man I had seen there was the Lord Jesus Christ that was in the hall. And like I said, over and over, the Lord said to me, time is going. That was some few years ago. Right now, again, the Lord is beginning to call my attention to the urgency of that message that he had given me some years ago. So the Lord has sent me to everyone who is hearing this, this message. He has sent me to call sinners to repentance. He has called, sent me to call the unbelievers and the backsliders to repent. To call the, bodies, the body of Christ to speed up whatever they are doing for, for God. And to warn all of the coming judgment or the consequence of sin. And to prepare men for, the, for rapture or for heaven. Recently, the Lord said something again. I was sitting in my room and I heard this voice. This is what you should tell the man. And I was wondering, I had, I had God say that to me. This is what you should tell the man. And I was wondering, which man am I supposed to be sharing the message with, Lord? Who is the man that the Lord is talking about? And what's the message about? So I was waiting to hear what the Lord will say to me. While I kept on waiting, I fell asleep. asleep. And I, as I fell asleep, I saw the Trinity. They came in a cartoon form. Now, God has some funny ways of dealing with me especially with revelations. I see some unusual revelations, like, you know, this one with a cartoon form, in cartoon form, and sometimes slow motion, you know, things like that, different kind of funny things that is not usual. And so I saw the Trinity. They came to me in a cartoon form. Three of them, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But they were up in the air, in a parachute. For the children, you know what parachute is? You know, those big, big baskets with a very big, you know, balloon-like thing at the top. It's that big balloon-like um, thing that keeps it afloat. So they were in the air. But you know, they know the funny thing? They were fishing in the sea below. You know, that's not usual. Somebody cannot be in a parachute and be fishing below. But because, to t also t tell you that that is God, or the Trinity, that is the Trinity, just like they are in the heavens, yet they are fishing upon the earth. That is exactly the way it was in that cartoon. So the three of them were up in the air, yet they were sh fishing in the sea below, which is, of course, the earth. And then the head said to one, the two others, he said, does this man know that time is going? And then he said to one of them, go and tell the man that time is going. And then in another place entirely, I saw another man, also in a cartoon form. He too was in a parachute. He was also fishing. And he was very, very, very busy. Then they brought the news to him and said, they said we should tell you that time is going. And then the man looked at the person that brought the message. He was like, time is going. So what? And that was how, you know, the revelation ended. And that was how I also woke up. And I realized the Holy Spirit made me to realize that the man 
is not one person. The man is the body of Christ. The man is everyone that cares to make heaven. And I thought to myself, if indeed the man is, for, is actually everybody, then it's, that message has to start with me. And I looked into my own life. I realized I've been, I've slowed down. Now, what, what, what was the Lord actually trying to tell that man is the first and most important thing we should try to understand. This man was busy, obviously, in that revelation. So why will the man who's busy be told that time is going? It simply means that he was probably, of course, most likely doing what the Lord has not sent him. In fact, that is just it. He was doing what the Lord has not sent him. And so, time is going for that which he ought to do. In other words, he has not started that which God has assigned him to do. Yes, he was busy fishing. The question is, what kind of fishes was he taking in? Or, this is the way I see it. I see it like, for instance, there are some pastors they are busy. Yes, in their churches, their churches are always very, very busy. And they are probably busy preaching or teaching. But the question is, what kind of preaching, what kind of teaching, what kind of messages are they feeding the fishes or the people with? That is the question. So if they are telling the church the wrong thing, which God has not sent them, it means that they have not started to do the work of God. And so God is saying, time is going. It could also mean that you are probably not a pastor or whatever. And you are actually doing your own business. And you seem to be very, very, very busy. But God is telling you, he's saying that that is not the message I have sent you. That is not the work I have sent you to do. So you need to stop and think and ask yourself, God, what am I assigned to do? What have you called me to do? So that you begin to do it for the Lord is saying, time is going. And probably you are actually the one who actually think you are really busy. Just like that man you know, in the, in the revelation. I could imagine that man was saying, time is going, so what about it? I could imagine that man was saying, if, if anybody needs to be told that time is going, you should go and tell it to those lazy people or to those people who are not doing anything. I, I imagine that is what the man was saying in his heart. But brethren, you know, God, our ways are not like God's ways. His ways are not like our ways. The way we think is not the way he thinks. You may say you are busy, but God is saying, that is not what I have called you to do. That is not what I have called you to do. And so like I said, I thought to myself, this message has to start with me. Because for me, yes, at one time of my life, I really began to run with the work of the Lord. I was doing the work of the Lord Almost on a daily basis, I was really busy doing the work of the Lord. But all of a sudden, there seems to be so, so much oppression all around me and everything. There was attack. Like the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 2.18, Paul said he was hindered, but that Satan hindered him. And so I was also hindered in many ways, even by people in the church. And so I was slowed down. And at one time, I was like, ah, I beg, now leave me, Joe. I actually slowed down and really I began to compromise too. And so when this message came, I realized first and foremost it has to start with me. And so I began to repent and to ask God for forgiveness of sin. Brethren, and from that day I decided I will begin to run with the work that the Lord has sent me. Now, brethren, I realized something that is happening in the body of Christ. The Lord began to remind me of something that is happening in the body of Christ. Like I said, many churches are very, very busy with so many programs these days. But what are we busy doing? In the body of Christ these days, a lot of motivational speakers have taken over the word. Whereas people are, begin, are supposed to be fed with the word, motivational speakings have taken over. Now, I'm not saying it is totally wrong to bring in motivational speakers. I am not saying that. 
But that should not be the main thing. The people should be fed with the word of God more than any other thing. But you see, these days we have motivational speakers and most of them are not even born again. Most of them are not born again. So what spirits are they imparting to the body of Christ? Brethren, it's a shock about some informations I came across recently. For instance, people like Norma, Norman Vincent P, um, Peel, who claims to be a Christian and the author of the bestseller, The, Posti the Power of um, Thinking. Is it The Power of Positive Thinking or something like that? I found out that this man is a staunch occultic, occultist. A staunch occultist. And this is a man whose book is being sold in many churches all over the world. And in fact, I am very sure that many of those churches have called him to even minister at their pulpits. Yet this man recently, he confessed to be a free man sin. He confessed to be in, uh, 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 on the 23rd degree of the free man sin. He, is, he was quoted on the website of the Grand um, Lodge of Britain, Colombia. And he said he had even been in the Lodge for over 60 years. This statement he made as at September 2008. And he even said that his own father had been in the Lodge for 50 years and his grandfather for another 50 years. So you can imagine what kind of spirit is being passed on to the church. This book, his books, I know that most, of, uh, most Christians read his book. For reasons I do not know, I think it's the whole, now I begin to understand that the Holy Spirit is the one that has prevented me from buying that book. Because several times I've wanted to buy that book, but for one reason or the other, I just, I just decided to buy something else. Now I know better. Brethren, he also mentioned the fact that a lot of, a lot of uh, 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 um, so-called pastors and ministers of God actually belong to these Freemasons. Now, I'm not trying to condemn, but I'm trying to say this so that we should be careful. He quoted that even people like um, Reverend, he said that people like Reverend Charles T. Atkins, president of the Lutheran Synod of the Eastern Peninsula, Pennsylvania uh, uh, is one of them. The others are Bishop of uh, Bishop James Freeman of the Episcopal, Episcopal Bishop of Washington D.C. Bishop Wills, Williams F. Adamson, one of the most important leaders of the Methodist Church, and so many other you know Christians. He even mentioned at least twelve other presidents as being part of this um, Freemason. Now we know that Freemason is nothing but an occultic group. Brethren, yet these are the people we in, invite into our churches. A lot of witchcraft messages are going on now, even in the body of Christ. People are talking about, you know, people are preaching about, you know, name it, see it, meditate, you know, see it in, 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 your, in your mind's eye and then it will come to pass. Brethren, we need to be careful. Some of those things are nothing but transmeditational. Transmeditational. And it cannot, it is not the same thing as faith. Transmeditation is witchcraft. It is not faith. But transmeditation today is being called or renamed or given the Christian name faith. Even in some churches. Brethren, what are we preaching? Are we preaching the message of the world or the message of Christ? Many people those days, they preach what the church, what the people would like to hear. But whose message are you supposed to preach? Is it what the people want or what God wants? Brethren, we need to be very careful. The church today spends so much money, time, and energy on issues of that are of very little or no relevance to God. Many churches have gone worldly, even singing dirty songs and doing dirty comedies and preaching rubbish at the altar. Many churches and ministers today 
have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, as it is written in 2 Timothy 3, 5. Brethren, I am not saying that we cannot have comedies. I am not saying we cannot have songs. But whatever song of comedies we are having, please let it be holy. Let us be very, very careful about the things we say. Somebody, somebody had a revelation very recently. He said in, there are people in hell who are in hell simply because of the songs that we are listening to. I'm surprised. But that was what he said. He said the Lord revealed to him, showed him people who are in hell, and they were there because of the wrong worldly songs they were listening to. Remember, the Bible says friendship with the world is what? Sin. It's enmity with God. Brethren, we need to be very careful. And what kind of churches are we going to? We need to check the spirits. We need to check the spirits. I remember one time having to listen to a so-called um, motivational speaker. And he said everything about um, how to know God's, um, God's will for your life or God's purpose for your life. But there was, nothing, there was nothing about going back to God, who is the author. In fact, somebody even asked the question, how do you know God's will for your, for, 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 your, for your life? And the person, you know, began to talk about you going to your friends, you doing this and that and that and that. He mentioned so many other things that you should do to know God's will for your life. But he never mentioned going back to God. And I had to stand up and say, hey, this is the way it should be. It should be God. God is our source. We should go back to God. Now, imagine that kind of man that has been brought to the church. A man who does not even understand that God is the one, is our source. Now, what do you expect him to pass on to others? <laughs> Brethren, we need to be very, very careful. We need to be very, very careful. Some of these ministers have nothing to do with God. Some of them are in the occult. We need to be careful. And so, you may be one of those people who are inviting all those people. Or you may be one of those people who is actually preaching all those wrong things. And you seem to be very, very busy. But the Lord is saying, you are, not, you are on your own. You are doing your own thing. I also remember one man of God, I think pa Elton by, by name, who had been a missionary in Nigeria for so many years. I, 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 was, I, I think um, somebody said this, that... Um, one day, the Lord called him and said, when will you start the work I sent you? He was shocked because he's been in Nigeria. He came to Nigeria thinking it was, yes, when he came to Nigeria, all the work he had been doing all this year, he actually thought that he's been doing the work of God. And he was shocked to now be told by God that when will he start doing the work he has sent? He was really shocked. And then he now asked, he said, God, all this work I've been doing, is it not your work? God said, no, it's, that's not my own work. You have been doing your own thing. You've not done my own work. And then I think God said to him, you have been called to build men. That is what I, I asked you to do, not to come and build um, uh, um, schools and whatever, whatever, whatever. Now, those things are good, but we must be very careful to do that which God has sent us. It is not, it is not it, well, it, it's to the eyes to the ordinary man, it seems good for us to be building schools. But is that relevant to souls? Is that relevant to the soul? Will, that, will building schools take a man to heaven? I am not saying that is bad. But let us be led by God. If God has called us to build schools, let us build schools. If God has called us to focus more on salvation of souls, let us focus more on salvation of souls. There is still nothing wrong building schools, but let that not be the major focus. Let us please redirect the purpose for which the Lord has sent us. And again, recently, I was at a CMS um, bus stop. And while at the CMS um, bus stop, I stumbled upon a magazine which said, um, I, I read the headline. It said, I think 125 Nigerians are ready for the rapture. And when I saw it, I laughed. I said, them don't come again. And I walked away. About two minutes thereabouts, the Lord reminded me of something that he had shown me. First, he reminded me of the revelation he showed me of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, the camp at the Redeemed Christian Church of God. And 
That was a few years back. And when I saw, when I, I saw that revelation, I saw that there was a mountain at the camp. And on top of the mountain was pa our father, Pastor Adeboye, the general overseer of the Redeemed Christian Church of God worldwide. He was ministering. And those of us that were with him were less than 500. Brethren, less than 500. Maybe between 300 and 500. I can't really say. But we are less than 500. Now, you can imagine for a church where about 20 million people gather during the August Convention or during the uh, um, Holy Ghost Congress in December. How come just about 500 people we are the people that God deemed as ready or fit for rapture? Because that was what the Holy Spirit made me to understand. These were the people fit or ready for rapture. That was one. Then recently, this year, the Lord gave me another revelation, February to be precise. And in that revelation, I saw thick darkness. It was thick darkness and there was high tension. And I saw people running. And I saw that I was one of the armies that was running. And I really didn't know at that particular moment, I didn't know what we were running for. But we were running and we were so much in a haste. It's as if we were running. It's like something must, some things must be accomplished on time. That was how I see it. And then I went upstairs to a family that had a teenager. And I was begging them to release their teenager for the work of the Lord. But they refused, you know. And when I got tired, I jumped down from the upstairs and joined back the army. And we began to run. There was high tension. Everywhere was dark. Now, I, re I really do not know what time that is. Or what time that was, rather. But that was how the revelation ended. But what I realized from that revelation is still the same thing. Time is going. Time is going. Over and over, I've heard the Lord said to me in different revelations I cannot begin to share right now. The time is going. Over and over, I've heard the Lord say, let us do the work that we need to do on time. At different times, the Lord had shown me the rapture. At different times, the revelations of the end. Brethren, we need to be very, very careful. We need to hasten up. That revelation shows that Jesus Christ is about to come. The last revelation I, I, I just talked about shows that Jesus Christ is about to come. And there is, that is why there is so much tension and panic and thick darkness. And it also shows that in that, that revel in that revelation, I realized that we were trying to be very fast in doing whatever we need to do to save souls. And that is my mission. That is the reason why I'm also, you know, sending this message across. Brethren, let us open to Exodus 32. The Bible says in Exodus 32 from chapter 1, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down, out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we will not what is become of him. Then the Bible says that, So Aaron made unto the Israelites gods. Then in verse 8, the Lord said, verse 7, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. And said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee out. And so in verse 10, the Lord says, Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and that I may make of thee a great nation. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him, that is verse 26, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. 
And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from the gates to gates throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. The Bible said when finally judgment happened, what happened? 3,000 men fell. Just like the, the Bible said about the children of Israel, in the wilderness, the church in the wilderness, after Moses had brought them out, Moses finally decided to go to the mount to go and meet the Lord and pray and hear what the Lord will have to say. And when he was gone, the people began to wait and wait and wait and wait for Moses. But it was as if Moses was not going to come back. And the people said to Aaron, Up, oh, make us a God. Make us a God that we can see, a God that we can, we, we, we can see. And so Aaron made a God unto them. But immediately he made the God, that was when Moses came back. Moses came back for the church when they were not ready for God. Moses returned at a time when the church was in deep sin. Moses returned at a time when the church was no longer conscious of God. When the church was more or less cut off, cut off from God. Brethren, just as it was in the time of old, in the time of the wilderness, when 3,000 people were killed because of their sin, that is what is about to happen even in this day. Just as it, as it was in the days in the wilderness with the church, Jesus Christ has brought us out from our darkness and he's gone to heaven. The Bible talks about Moses that he's gone to the mount. Now, Moses here is a type of Jesus Christ and the mount is a type of heaven that Jesus Christ has also gone into. So just like Jesus Christ has gone to heaven, people are beginning to say, this Jesus Christ will not know what has become of him. This Jesus Christ, I don't think he's coming again. In fact, many people, they said, Oh, maybe he has even forgotten. Oh, maybe this Jesus Christ is dead. Because my great-grandfather told me. My grandfather told me. But he hasn't come. There is something wrong. I'm sure Jesus Christ is not coming again. That is what people are saying. But hello, is Jesus Christ coming or he's not coming? Is Jesus Christ coming or he's not coming? Certainly, he will come. The Bible says in 2 Peter verse Chapter 3, verse 9. That the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. What promise? The promise that Jesus Christ will come. As some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is not willing that any should perish. The Bible says in verse 8 of that same chapter, it says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the, with, with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. You are the one who's saying time is going. You are the one who said it's a thousand years. You are the one who's saying, it's, my, even my great grandfather was told the same thing. And you're saying time has gone. So Jesus Christ probably must have forgotten or Jesus Christ probably is dead. I can tell you that Jesus Christ is not dead because I have seen him at different times. Even this year I have seen him. So you cannot tell me Jesus Christ is dead because this is somebody I know that 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 I know. He's alive and well. This is somebody who talks to me. And I'm sure many of you, you also hear him. So I know that Jesus Christ is alive and well. And that is why at the name of Jesus Christ, the dead, they still rise. The deaf, they still, they, they still receive their, their, their hearing. And the blind, they see. Why? Because Jesus Christ is alive. So God is saying, you are the one who's saying time is going. But to him, your thousand years is just a day before the Lord. Your thousand years is just a day before the Lord. But suddenly, brethren, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is here before us. I heard about um, something that happened at Ibadan recently. I was told some people saw an angel 
at Ibadan recently. And I think they said they saw two angels. And these two angels were about to blow the trumpet. But suddenly, what happened? Somebody appeared beside the angels. And then, like, begging and beckoning on the angels to put down the trumpets. He actually pushed down the trumpets from their hands. I know that person must be the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe strongly must be the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's always one person. He's always the one who's always begging the father to give more time to the children. But funny enough, even Jesus Christ, there was a time he actually wanted to come. How do I know? Somebody gave a revelation recently. He said the Lord Jesus Christ took him to heaven in the spirit's realm. And when the Lord Jesus Christ took him to heaven, what happened? He said the first thing he wanted to see was the clock because he has heard about the clock in heaven several times from people. And so he wanted to see the clock in heaven and he was looking all out for the clock. And Jesus Christ asked, what are you looking for? He said, the clock, the clock, where is it? And Jesus Christ said to him, there is no more clock in heaven. There is no more time in heaven. He said, Lord, what do you mean? He said, there is no more time in heaven. That the time in which he's supposed to come is far, far, far gone. He, he was supposed to have come long, long, long time ago. He said, right now we are living in the time of the Father's grace. We are living in the time of the Father's grace. That is what the Lord Jesus Christ said to him. And he said he should go and want, want the body of Christ. So that he will not come on our ears to them. He will not come at a time they are, where they are not expecting him. He will not come when they are not ready. Another person had this revelation. And he said between February and August last year, 2009. He said that the Lord revealed to him that only one person made heaven. Brethren, only one person made heaven. Between February and August 2009, how come only one person made heaven? How come only one person made heaven? Brethren, what happened to all the Christians that died during that period? You and I know that at least a thousand people, I'm sure more than that, die every day. The minimum of a thousand people die every day. So how come between February and August 2009, only one Christian made it? Knowing fully well that so many other Christians died. What happened to all these other Christians? Brethren, we need to examine ourselves. The Bible says examine yourself whether you, still, you are still in the faith. Examine yourself whether you are still in the faith. Because you may think, ah, yes, I'm going to church, I'm going to. It is not enough to go to church. Brother, we are not talking about works. Works cannot save us. I'll give you an example of my mom. My mom, my, my mom and I got born again at the same, on the same day. And she was a very, very dedicated Christian. In fact, almost more, almost more dedicated than I am. My mom, after she left um, Christ Chapel, she joined um, what's it called um, the Winners Chapel. And because the Winners Chapel was so far from her house at Ojo Road, she decided to go and rent a, a, an apartment next door to a Winners, house, a Winners Chapel, three houses away from Winners Chapel. Now that is wrong for a, a woman who's married, but that was how my mother, my own mother, understood her own Christianity. But I say to the married women, it is wrong. But in spite of the fact that her house was just four houses away from the winner's chapel, my mom will leave, will be, will be at the church by four o'clock in the morning. This is a woman in her, in, in, in her mid-sixties. As her then she was like, I think sister four. And she was in every department. She was in ushering. She was in... Uh, uh, sanitation, she was in this, that, 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 that. She was almost everywhere. Even when they were building their church, my mommy would carry, at her old age, she would carry sand 
cement on her head. She participated in building, and I'm talking about a woman. Is not, she's not, my mommy is not a poor woman. She's at least okay. She may not be so rich. She's okay. Even when she has money, or when she's been given money, my mommy will carry almost everything to her church. She was giving her church almost everything. Sometimes, even me, I'll ask my mom for money. She won't give, <laughs> it's funny, she won't give me money. Only from some members of our church who now come and tell me that banker, eh? ah, go and help us to thank your mom. She's the one that is paying her, her school fees, uh, 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 Bible school fees. So many people will come to me and go and help me to thank. And I will be like, ah, how can my mom be paying people's school fees and paying uh, for this and that for people? And then she's not giving me money. But I, I now realize that that was how God actually wanted it. God wanted me to depend solely on her. No wonder from a very, very young age, I'd always been on my own. You know, but what I'm trying to say is that my mommy was very diligent in church. She was very committed. But suddenly, the Lord told me, Banke, I heard it in my ears. I wasn't sleeping one afternoon. The Lord told me, Banke, your mom is going. Now, before that, for almost 20 years, my mom will have actually died. At different times over before 20 years, she will have actually died. But I had struggled with the Lord and prayed, even before I became a, a, a believer, I had been praying concerning my mom that God will give her a long life. And so I've struggled with, with God concerning my mom to give her a long life because I really love her. And so when God told me this, I was like, ah, no, it's it can't be. Then one day again, I went to visit her at Aikpaja house. Then I was still a parish, I was still a parish pastor at Tikoi. And on getting there, the Lord said to me, Banke, because even though the Lord had said to me he was taking my mom in my heart, I didn't want to let go. Then the Lord said to me, Banke, do you want your mom to remain like this? At that moment, I gave up. I didn't see anything, but I knew in my heart. Automatically, I was saying, Lord, let your will be done. And I was like, who am I anyway that the Lord should ask me for permission? But that was how much the Lord loved me. I'm not worth it. I'm nobody. Yet, the Lord still loved me that much to be asking me, taking my permission before he takes my mom away. Anyway, I went back to my parish, and then I was told two weeks or so thereabouts that my mom is in the hospital. I went there. Before then, I had actually ministered to my mom. I had led her over and over to Christ because I saw some little, little sins, little foxes that would spoil the vine in her life. I had led her to Christ over 20 times. And so they told me my mom was in the hospital, and I went there. And I led my mom again to the Lord. This is a woman who is born again. The same day as I got born again. She's been in the Lord for so many years. But I led her to Christ again. And then she gave, you know, she did. Of course, my mom is one person. She doesn't argue with me. She gave her life. She rededicated her life. I was told that immediately I left the, the church that Friday night. Because I had to go for my area parish meetings and pastor's meeting. They said that my mom went into coma. And they said immediately, I, then on, on, on Monday morning, I came back, because there were so many meetings during the weekend. I came back, and immediately I stepped into the, into the hospital. My mom opened her eyes. And people looked at me and wondered, ah, what is it about you, this girl? Immediately you left on Friday night. Your mom went into coma. And immediately you step into this uh, uh, hospital, your mom opened her eyes. Well, she opened her eyes and looked at me for another maybe five minutes, and then she went into coma again. Then that night, throughout my stay in the hospital, I never really slept. But I really don't know what happened, but I think I took off for a minute or two. And as I took off, I saw myself in the spirit in heaven. 
my body was like, it was like my, from my bust up was in heaven. Like I was peeping into heaven. And there I saw my mom. As at this time, my, my mom was 67. But when I saw my mom, she looked like a 20 years old girl or like a teenager. She looked so beautiful. She looked so refreshing, so beautiful. And she was wearing white and her white was dazzling, shining, glowing. And you know, God is so funny. In this revelation, it was a slow motion picture. I have never seen that kind of revelation before. Just like the revelation of the cartoon, I have never seen anyone after that one. And just like this revelation of the slow motion picture, I have never seen one before. And after that, I have never seen any other one. But that was what the Lord gave me. I realized that what the Lord was saying is, Banker, this is your own special package. I love you this much, and I'm giving you a special package. I know taking your mom will be painful, but this is the best I'm doing for you. And so I saw my mom in that slow motion picture. She was even having a Chinese court. <laughs> God had given her a Chinese court. And, you know, she was jumping in the cloud like a small baby, jumping up and down in the cloud. She was all joy. It's as if she's a person called joy. Joy was just flowing out of her. And she went like that, like a model, like an angel that was modeling. Banke. You know, she would turn left and right. And I was like, God, what's this? And that was how the revelation ended. Praise the Lord. That was how the revelation ended. And it, I think it was the next day my mom finally gave up. Now, why am I giving you this revelation of my mom? The Lord said, everywhere I have the opportunity, I should share the revelation of my mom. My mom, like I said, she was a very, very diligent worker. She was a very consistent worker. But yet, there were issues in the life of my mom. If she had died without rededicating her life, without repenting, there was no way she was going to make heaven. Because there was bitterness, there was unforgiveness towards her husband, towards one of her child. And I realized my mom wasn't going to make heaven with all those things in her life. And so I asked mom, I said, mom, you have to let go. You have to forgive. Remember, you're going soon. I'm talking about a woman who is so dedicated that even when, you know, she came, the, at that particular time, she actually came under an attack and she was partially paralyzed. One of her legs was partially paralyzed, so she, she, she couldn't walk. And if she had to walk, she had to hold on to the walls. My mom, in spite of her age and in spite of her condition, in early in the morning, she would go around the fence of her house because at that time she couldn't go out at 67. She couldn't go out anymore because of that attack. She would go around the fence of her house and she would be shouting, Give your life to Jesus! Jesus is coming! Give your life to Jesus! She would go around the halls one by one, the four corners of the halls, and she will do that. And brethren, in spite of that, the Lord made me to understand that works is not enough. My mom couldn't preach any message. Couldn't really preach well. She couldn't really quote verses. But those little things she did, God remembered her and God honored her. And the reason why God began to tell me was to help her to make it right in her life. And thank God for his mercies because not everybody will have had that opportunity. But thank God, the Lord is also giving every one of you here the opportunity to make it right. God gave uh, my mom the opportunity to make it right. And because of that, she made heaven. So it's your own time to make it right with God. You are born again, yes. You are a church worker, yes. You are very, very diligent, yes. But what are those issues that will hinder you from heaven? What are those issues that will hinder you from heaven? And what are those issues that hindered 
So many of those Christians who did not make heaven. Let's even forget about those, you know, in the other years. If between 2000, uh, February 2009 to August 2009, what stopped all those Christians who died from making heaven? There were issues in their life. And brethren, the Lord is calling us to repentance so that we will not end up in hell. Because the Lord had made me to realize that there are so many pastors and general overseers and so many other Christians in hell. So it's not enough if we are pastors or we are general overseers. We must make it right. Our hearts must be right with God. And we must make sure that we are doing the work of the Lord. Brethren, I give you the testimony of my... Oh, should I call it? Uh, no, don't let me call it testimony. I'll give you the story of my father. Seven months after my, my, my mom's death, the Lord told me that he was taking my father. And I was like, God, my father is not born again. He's a Muslim. He's not born again. And this man has refused to give his life to Christ. Several times I've preached to him, but he refused to preach, give his life to Christ. And he had always said he would die a Muslim. That's the way. My father is a very stubborn man. Very stubborn man. You can't change him. And you can't win an argument with my father. He always wins. When there is an argument, you will be the one to give up. My father always wins. And so I went to my father. And I told him, Daddy, this is what the Lord says. Put your house in order. But my father looked at me. Uh, Banker don't come again. Now let she they see. Now let she they hear. I left. I knew my father didn't believe me. I tried to make him believe, but he didn't believe me. Of course, by the time I left, my father went to my in-laws, and they all began to laugh. They told me later after my father's death, so I knew. They all laughed. They said, mm, Banker don't come again. No. See what in talk. Oh. Now only she they see. Now only she they hear. Two weeks later, I was called. They said my father is in the hospital. Just like my mom's um, case. And then I went to the hospital and I said, Daddy, I told you about my mom. And I told you that after my mom died, I saw my mom in heaven. And I said, Daddy, I will see my mom finally when I get to heaven. When I die and go to heaven, I will see my mom. Or when I'm raptured with Christ, I'm going to see my mom. But for you, Dad, I will never, never, never see you again. For the first time in his life, it's like my daddy came to his senses. And for the first time in his life, he gave his life to Christ. Hmm. I'm sure you, you, should, you, you would rejoice with me hearing this. But brethren, there is nothing to rejoice about. Because after I left for my house at Ikui, and that is the biggest mistake I made, I should have taken my father with me to Ikui, but I left my dad behind. That is the greatest mistake I ever made in my life. The greatest mistake. Because as soon as I left, they said his um, Muslim friends and our fans, they came back. And, you know, they did all their prayers. And as long as they did that prayers, what happened? He lost his salvation. They took his soul off from the Lamb's Book of Life. They removed his name from the Lamb's Book of Life. And his soul was sold back to the devil. My father lost it. He lost it. He never made it. And I began to ask the Lord after my father died. I think um, it was ab about a week or two thereabouts. My father finally died. I began to ask the Lord, Lord, where is my dad? Where is my dad? But the Lord will not answer me. For more than one month, I was asking, where is my dad? Of course, I felt he lost it. But, you know, sometimes you try to deceive yourself. That, oh, maybe probably he ended up in heaven. So I began to ask, but the Lord will not answer me. Finally, about three months or so, after I'd forgotten about 
you know, this. I, the Lord finally showed me my dad. And I saw my dad. He was all burnt up. Burnt up. He was so black. With, in rags. That was the man I saw. Obviously, a man from hell. And I realized that my daddy went to hell. My dad is in hell where the worms will eat men forever. Where the fire will never go out. That is where my father went to. I talked to him. I pleaded with him when he was alive. He just wouldn't listen. And that is where he has ended up in hell. That is where my father is. Hebrew 12. The Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I'm reading Hebrews 12. One to two. And verse six of that same Hebrew 12 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, wherefore are you bast are you are you partakers? Then are ye bastards and not sons. Verse 14 of Hebrew 12 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Least any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defied. Least there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Brethren, the Bible says that we are compassed with so great a witness. We are compassed with great clouds of witnesses. There are people who have gone to heaven who are looking at us and saying, oh, I wish she will do well. Oh, I wish he will hurry up. Oh, I wish he will do this for the Lord. Oh, I wish that he will do that for the Lord. People are hoping against hope in heaven that we can really run this race. And God is waiting for us to really run this race and to make it to the end. And the Lord is saying, put away, put aside every weight that can easily beset you. Put away sin that will cost you to make heaven. Remove yourself from every, 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 every hindrance that will stop you in heaven. Again, I read um, 2 Peter 3, verse, um, from verse 6. It says, whereby... From verse 5. 2 Peter 3 from verse 6. No, sorry. I'm reading from verse 3. 2 Peter 3, 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days coffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the waters and in the water, 
whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Verse 10. The Bible says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are daring shall be burnt up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking diligent, looking and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we look, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye be found of him in peace and without spot and blameless. The Bible says that this earth is reserved unto fire. That the day is going to come that this earth will be burnt up. The day is coming when this earth that you see is going to be burnt up. And the Bible is therefore calling every man to repentance. The Bible is saying we should all repent before it is too late. The Bible is saying that we should look Unto Jesus. And we should be expectant, be watchful, even of our behaviors, of the things that we do, the things that we say. The Bible says in Hebrew 9.27, And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, judgment. Brethren, no man dies twice. Don't believe that story of purgatory. It does not exist. Purgatory does not exist. Once you are dead, that is the end of the story. Once you die upon this earth, that is the end of the story. Therefore, if you know you've only got one life, what kind of person should you be? What manner of person should you be? Of course, if you know you've only got one life, it is wisdom for you to be very careful. You may say it's been so long that the Lord Jesus Christ, they've said the Lord Jesus Christ is, is coming and he hasn't come. Brethren, do you realize that some people die today? What if you should die today? Will you be able to make heaven? If you should die today, will you be able to make heaven? Let's even forget about Jesus Christ is coming or is not coming. Anybody can die at any time. Anybody can die at any time. Some, some, um, some few, I think it was about two months ago, I had gone to minister at a parish, one of the redeemed Christian church of God. And on my way coming, I collapsed and passed out. It was an attack. Then the Holy Spirit woke me up and said, Banker, you're on the floor. Stand up. I stood up. But hello, I was not panicked at all. I had no fear whatsoever in me. In fact, there was absolute peace within me. I was not panicked that, ah, that was death coming. Or, oh, I'm about to die. Mm -mm. Even when I saw it coming, yes, because I actually saw it coming before it, I finally passed out. I saw that it was, it was like I was blanking out. But even when I was blanking out, I had no fear whatsoever. I had, I, there was absolute peace within me. Why? Because I knew at that time I was, my heart was right with the Lord. And I said to myself when I woke up, I said, if I died like this, it will, it will be such a, a wonderful thing. I know I will have made heaven gloriously. In fact, that day, over 100 people had given their lives to Christ that day. It would have been glorious. So I knew I would have made heaven anyway. Not because I have won souls, but because I had decided to put my life right before the Lord. And I said it would have been a wonderful way to die like this. What if it is you? What if that should come today, this minute? Will you be able to make heaven? And what if that does not come? What if it is the Lord Jesus Christ that should come? Will you be able to make heaven? Many of us these days, we are not ready to suffer with the Lord. Many of us, we are not ready to sacrifice for the Lord. But what does the Bible say in 2 Timothy 2, 12? The Bible says, if we, suffer with, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. 
brethren, have we denied the Lord? In our ways, have we denied the Lord? In the things that we do, the things that we say, have we denied the Lord? Brethren, today is the day of reckoning. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 30, 15, 15 to 20. The Bible says, See, I have said before you this day, life and good, death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, and to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, and his statutes, and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but thou shalt be drawn away, and worship other gods, and serve them, I denounce unto you this day, that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whither thou passest over the Jordan to go and possess it. He says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore the Lord says, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Brethren, the Lord is asking you today, choose life. He says, he has set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. What will you choose? You want to give your life to Christ. Wherever you are, I want you to come. Come, the Lord is waiting for you. Brethren, tomorrow may be too late. The Bible says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Remember him when you still have life, when you still have strength, before it is too late. Many people who, who die, they never realized that they would have died at that time. They never knew that they were going to die at that time. But suddenly they died. Many people are in hell, they are crying. And many people in hell, they wish they can just come back. The Lord showed one man, People in hell that we are saying, oh, Lord, just give us one second, one second just to come to this earth. And the Lord will ask them, what are you coming to do, to do on, on there? They said they just want to come and repent and give their lives to Christ. That is the reason why they want to come forward. Just one second. And here we are, many of you, you have life. But you have refused to give your life to Christ. But if you want to make it right with the Lord, come out right now. I want to pray with you. You want to give your life to Christ. Come out. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Now say this after me. Raise up your hands and say this after me. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to forgive me my sins. I know you sent Jesus Christ into this world to die for my sins. Today, I accept Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Father, I break every covenant I have made with the devil. Satan, I bind and cast you out in the name of Jesus. I break every covenant any man, any woman, or my parents or ancestors have made on my behalf with the devil. Father, I ask that you use the blood of Jesus to wash away my sins. Today, I accept Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Holy Spirit, enable me to run this race and to finish well. Father, write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you, God, for all, all those ones that have accepted Jesus Christ today. I pray, O oh God, that you strengthen them and cause them to be rooted in Christ Jesus till the end in Jesus' mighty name. I pray for everyone out there who's hearing this word. I pray in the name of Jesus that you begin to run for the Lord and you begin to make haste in whatever assignment the Lord has given unto you. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will not be cast away. May the Lord bless you mightily. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. This message, titled The Revelations of the End, is brought to you by Pastor Banke Oyebade, one of the ministers under Pastor Ben Akabweze of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, the King's Court Parish, 1387 Olosa Street, Victoria Island, Lagos. For inquiries, call 0802-826-3408. That ye shall 
not prolong your days upon the land, whither thou passest over the Jordan to go and possess it. He says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have 